Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited that you have chosen to join us this evening for the second of our three public lectures we're hosting this semester brought to you by the Alumni Department. My name is Marva Gertsen and I'm the Director of Alumni and Community Engagement at Ambrose University. Just before we get started, I wanted to run over a few housekeeping details. You will notice at the bottom of your screen, because this is a webinar in Zoom, you have a Q&A uh, toggle at the bottom. And throughout the lecture, if there are questions that you would like uh, presented at the end of this evening, please go ahead and pop them in there because our moderator, Lee Umba, will be presenting questions um, when our professors are done speaking tonight and we will get through as many as time allows. So feel free to put them there. Um, and I'm also thrilled uh, that we have a sponsor for our public lectures uh, this semester, Deeks Insurance, and I'm excited that they have chosen to join us. Well, without any further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Joanne Badley to come and introduce our presenters this evening. Welcome to Ambrose. My name is Joanne Badley and I'm Dean of Theology here. This evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce two colleagues from the Faculty of Theology. Dr. Colin Toffelmeyer is Associate Professor of Old Testament, and Dr. John Coots is Assistant Professor of Theology. Colin has been at Ambrose longer than me, and this is John's second year on faculty. I really like working with these men for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that they volunteer for gigs like this. I ask them what draws them into a conversation about the Bible and the history of race. For both of them, this conversation is a personal one. For Colin, wrestling with questions of what the Bible is and who the Bible is for pushed him to think about questions of race and colonialism years ago. And for John, thinking about these questions has transformed his own biblical and theological understanding. For both of them, they realize that this conversation is first of all about seeing how issues of race have affected how they read the Bible and think about God's work in the world. This has meant both some personal unlearning and then relearning. It also means they want to participate in this conversation as those who understand that they have benefited when the topic is not on the table. Welcome John and Colin. Well, hello everyone, thanks Joanne, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is John, and this is Colin here with me. And Colin, it is really good to see you again. Uh, we have not been in the same room more than once in the last year, so this is yes. pretty wild um, and great. And it's really cool to be here, uh, to be able to talk about this important topic with, with each other and with all of you that are gonna participate in this, and, and some of you will even have questions later. So thanks for joining us. Um, you may have heard of the show Between Two Ferns. Well, today it is we are we have a fern. I think sorts. that's I think that's a technically cactus. a succulent, actually. Right, okay. my, my wife is watching right now and she will clarify that that is a succulent. In any case, it is <laughs> it is between two white guys. Yes. And uh, I think before we start, we sort of need to uh, name the elephant in the room or the white guys in the room and ask ourselves the question, why are we doing this? We maybe we shouldn't be. So Colin, uh, why us? Why are we doing this? Yeah, which, which let's, let's start with this. First of all, that's a fair question, right? It isn't, it isn't a throwaway question. It's an important question, and we don't want to be defensive about it. It's important for us to think about this. So there's, there's two things I want to say about this. Like, why, why do we have uh, the two of us talking uh, about this particular topic? So two things I want to say about this. First of all, I want to be clear that most of the things that we're going to say this evening um, that we're really talking about well-known history. We're talking about uh, pretty well-established theories and concepts uh, and theories and concepts that have been put forward principally by people of color. These are like our bibliography, which we're gonna show you at the end is made up uh, not entirely, but almost entirely of people of color. And so um, we are depending very heavily on those voices. That's one thing that I'll say. We, we have no interest at all in centering our own work, our own selves. Uh, we really consider ourselves learners in this process. And we're really just trying to receive this history and to receive some of these critiques uh, in a spirit of Christian charity. Charity is sort of at the center of what we're trying to do here, to, to understand, to listen, 
uh, and to take seriously the conversations that we're trying to have here. The second thing that I want to say is that while it's vital that we always work to place the voices of people of color at the center of conversations like this, um, it's also important to note that the emotional burden of processing these painful conversations about race should not fall only upon those neighbors who already bear the brunt of racist behavior. Um, those of us who have benefited from undue privilege are responsible to, to shoulder some of the burden in working to undo some of those injustices from the past. So those are sort of my two ways of thinking about, you know, why do we have two white guys talking about this, this uh, particular topic? John, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, that's right. Um, we certainly don't want to center um, white voices on this conversation of or even any conversation. As a matter of fact, we, I kind of have a rule of thumb not to be in this situation where I'm <laughs> on like what I call a mantle. Um, but when we were asked to do this public lecture um, with our two disciplines, biblical studies and systematic theology, you know, with what we've been dealing with in the last year and all the heightened interest in this, I just asked if we could talk about this because like you said, um, it really sticks in my mind when um, I read that a residential school survivor um, when asked to share his story of in, uh, mistreatment uh, in Canada, I think it was in 1965 or so, they said, can you tell us your story of abuse in residential schools? And he said, first thing he said was, um, well, this isn't really my story, but yours. And I think the, you know, the point there is that, um, yeah, this is a, a shared history. And um, yeah, like you said, we have a certain responsibility, particularly within our disciplines, biblical studies and theology, to name this stuff. And, and um, also I thought it would be really helpful and we thought it'd be really helpful for those of you tuning in who are alumni or who are interested uh, in this topic to, um, to have us walk through it. And so we just want this to be a service um, and hopefully that's the spirit in which it's taken. Um, so yeah, let's get into it then. Yeah. Okay, so you'll be seeing slides at various points. We have three basic parts of this lecture tonight and we just wanna start with a kind of history of the modern problem of race. So the, the first question, just what is race? Where did this come from? So Colin, why don't you uh, start us off? Yeah, sure. So this is sort of like a, a quick history. And, and I mean, this is, like a, this is like a history speed run. We're gonna go like centuries yeah. at a time. So I'm, I am, uh, and I just wanna say this at the outset, I am skipping over enormous amounts of detail and nuance and a lot of what we're gonna say, but we only have kind of finite time and resources. And there's some things that we just wanna paint a picture of here. And so the very first thing I wanna start with, and, and this is sometimes surprising, it's surprising to my students sometimes when we start here, um, when we're gonna start a conversation about the history of race, uh, I'm gonna actually start us in the 15th century AD. Uh, and some people are like, that seems weird. Why are we starting so recently? Why are we not starting further back? Well, this it's not because there was no concept of culture or no concept of ethnicity before the 15th century. Obviously there are concepts of ethnicity and culture before the 15th century, uh, but, this is where certain ideas uh, start to really get traction, especially in Europe, uh, and then consequently sort of make their way out into the rest of the world. And there's sort of three pieces to this, the three components of what's getting traction here. The, the first thing that starts to get traction around the 15th century um, is the notion of there being kind of distinct, um, in some cases, like races or subspecies of human beings, in some cases, actually distinct species of human beings. There are some people who think actually different races come from completely different genetic origins. Um, but that, that's, that idea sort of begins around now. And uh, this, this is scientists and Yeah, scientists and, and natural, like, I mean, nobody calls himself a scientist in the 15th century, right. but natural philosophers yep. and philosophers are thinking about this in the 15th century. The second thing you start to see is those ideas of race or racialization start to, they start getting indexed to physical features or what we call phenotypic features. Uh, so what people look like, the way that our bodies look, like the color of our skin or, uh, or the shape of our nose or the way that our hair looks. Um, these start to get indexed, these conversations about race or about species. And then the third thing, and this is very important in this, is that those two pieces, both the notion of races and races being uh, sort of uh, re related to or indexed to physical features, that also gets put into a hierarchical relationship where you have some of those races, and I'm going to use scare quotes for races a lot here, and we'll see why. Um, some of those races are uh, better or more important, and some are inferior or less important. And that's another really important concept. And this 
it's not like it comes out of the blue in the 15th century, but it does begin in a meaningful way near the end of the 15th century. So, and this, of course, the 15th century is what we call the age of exploration for yeah. Europe. This is when Europeans start getting in boats and going places really far away on a regular basis. Uh, and of course, we all know, you've got some, I think the slides up on the screen now. Uh, we all know 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, is how I learned it as a kid. Um, in 1492, Christopher Columbus um, uh, in, encounters um, people that he refers to as quote unquote Indians, but of course he's encountering the native population of islands that we know call the Bahamas. Um, and, uh, and this is an encounter with a new civilization for him. Um, and he brings news of this back to, uh, to Europe. And so at, at that point, we really have the beginnings of the Portuguese and Spanish, especially colonization of various territories in the Americas and in Africa and other places eventually as well. And over the next two centuries from there, more and more European nations start to get into the, the sort of colonization game or into the, the empire building game becomes part of what happens here. And so um, over this period, um, we also start to see uh, European nations um, essentially kidnapping people from other places in the world and bringing them either to Europe or to other places where there are colonies to work uh, as slaves. Uh, and so um, if you read, for example, Willie Jennings' uh, work, The Christian Imagination, he tells the story of, of Portuguese uh, explorers bringing uh, people from Africa to, to Portugal. Uh, and I think it's less, you know, like the late 1400s. Um, but by 1700 or so, uh, roughly 3 million slaves have been taken uh, by force, mostly by Portuguese and Spanish colonizers. And then if we skip ahead another century, over the next century, um, by about 1800, roughly 6 million slaves have been now been taken, largely by English, Dutch, and French colonizers. And then um, in the 19th century, uh, around, uh, by around 1900, another three and a half million or so slaves taken, but at this point, mostly uh, by private corporations because some European nations had begun the process of abolishing slavery, though certainly not all. And as I think a lot of us know, certainly not uh, the North American colonies where we see lots of slaves being taken either to um, the Caribbean or to the North American colonies at this point. So it's an enormous number of people, John, like we're talking about 10, 12 million people that are that are taken over several hundred years. At some point, it just is the economy, yeah. right? And you don't even necessarily have to go kidnap because someone is going to already do the kidnapping for you and meet you on the shore and and you'll and sell them to you, right? Yeah, and so. there are huge slave trades set up at at both at both points, right? Like either in Africa when when uh, people arrive in ships, and so yeah, there, there's like a huge economy, and we call this economy the North Atlantic tra slave yeah, and trade. And most people back home, yeah. have no contact with it like physically. Yeah, it's it's unseen and unheard, you know. But they also most they know people back it. home, yeah. they know about it a little bit, but they also reap the the economic benefits Absolutely. of it because a lot of the things that are happening in terms of uh, generating um, economic wealth are happening because of slavery. All and all over the various empires, right? Not just in one place, but all over the various. But empires. they have a way of rationalizing this, right? That makes sense. So how does that yeah. work? So and and here is where parallel to all the um, the taking of uh, slaves. Um, there are some ideas that start to get generated uh, in European philosophical and eventually what will eventually be called science in, in European philosophical circles. And, and we can call this, we can talk about this as like race theory. Um, where, where again, I mentioned this before, but just to reiterate, where we're now um, indexing or categorizing people based on uh, color or other kinds of physical characteristics. Um, over and above their regional or cultural identities, right? Before this period, um, it's a little bit more common to uh, think of where people are from and not what people look like in terms of their mm -hmm. identity. Uh, and so we now are dislocating people's identity from the lands where they live or the languages they speak maybe and really relocating it to their body right, to the, the actual uh, personal body. And we're placing that into a hierarchy of relative goodness. But this happens over time. So um, if we think, for example, um, uh, if we start in like the late 17th century. Um, so this begins uh, relatively early on in the history I've just outlined. Uh, there's a scholar named Bernier, who in 1684 develops a taxonomy for what he calls the four different species of human being. He subdivide, subdivides human beings into four different races or species. So Europeans are one, 
And there's some other people in this category, Europeans and also uh, North American indigenous people. They belong to one species of human. Uh, the Sub-Saharan African people are another group of people. The Asian people are another group of people. And then finally, the Laps uh, or the people of Finland or the Norse people sort of. A, uh, and he really, uh, this surprised me a little bit when I ran across Bernier, he really doesn't like the laps. He, he really puts them right at the very bottom of this hierarchy. So there's this hierarchy of, of goodness. I mean, I chuckle because there's a bunch of examples of these. Bernier is just one. Yeah. And so then you see they're different. And like they For did, some they reason, he's, he doesn't like the Nordic people. Yeah. But and all he, the lists are different yeah. with some overlap. And, they, and they're not totally arbitrary, but they are a little yeah. arbitrary sometimes, right? Yeah. Which, is, which is one of the revealing things about them, right? These lists are not absolute, but they are presented as... Um, as absolute observations of how the natural world really works. Yeah. That's how these are presented by philosophers. Um, so uh, jumping ahead, we'll jump ahead another hundred years because we're doing <laughs> things a century at a time here. There's lots that happens apart from this, but jumping ahead another hundred years, um, the term Caucasian, we're all really familiar with this term Caucasian. And sometimes we refer to people with pale skin like me, we refer to ourselves as Caucasian. Well, the term Caucasian is actually coined in 1775, which is, again, relatively historically recently. It's coined by uh, a scholar named Hans Blumenbach. Um, and Blumenbach gets uh, some of the, the influence he's getting is from the very famous German philosopher Immanuel Kant is, is uh, influencing Blumenbach here a little bit. And Blumenbach makes this argument that the Caucasian people are, um, are the best people. And one of the ways he gets this argument that the white races have a common origin with one another. And that common origin is in uh, the Caucasus, which is like a sort of region in Georgia in like sort of near what used to be part of, when I was a kid, it was part of the Soviet Union. It's, it's Eastern country. Europe. No. Eastern no. Europe, yeah. Um, and uh, and in, the, in and around the Caucasus, and this is one of my, I don't know if this is, I was gonna say this is one of my favorite things. It's, it's really, it's both horrible and also a little bit funny. Um, is that the reason he gives for calling all people with lighter colored skin, everybody in Europe is a Caucasian uh, because the people of Georgia are the most beautiful people. They're the most beautiful people in the world in his mind. Uh, now, this is intriguing because you can see, first of all, all sorts of presuppositions about standards of beauty operating here, right? He's, he's assuming what beautiful is. Uh, and I don't think everybody in the world would agree with his assumptions. And of course, he's also wrong. Uh, which we which we have, we know now we're going to get to genetic science eventually, but we know that not all European peoples are descended from people in the Caucasus region. Caucasus region. Um, that that's that's just materially and historically incorrect. But this is where he locates the origins of white Europeans. And they all have these different indexes or taxonomies, yeah. but they're not that different because pretty much all of them find some way of having. Yeah the Caucasians or the white skinned Europeans at the top. Yeah, no matter who's at the very, but well, the top and the bottom tend to be almost always the same. The middle sometimes fluctuates a little bit. The top, you can be just about guaranteed that you're gonna get white Europeans. Um, and at the bottom, you can be just about guaranteed in the scale, you're gonna get people um, in Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. The darker the skin, the farther down the scale normally. Uh, and then there's a little bit of debate about um, uh, the relative, and again, this sounds very vile to say out loud, but we want to try to name this and, and, and acknowledge that this is how some European philosophers and thinkers thought. Um, you, the relative value of, for example, uh, the people of Asia versus the people of Europe versus the people of Africa will be a, a matter of debate, depending and on- And you can go and read encyclopedia entries from the yeah. 18th century and, and see elaborate explanations. This is just, isn't just arbitrary. Yeah. It seems like it now, maybe to us, but- um, there were reasons. Yeah, they would, <laughs> they would give purported reasons right. why, uh, why Europeans are more, Advanced, very much like, like yeah. Blumenbach's uh, beautifulness argument, yeah. right? Yeah. That the Caucasians are beautiful and therefore yeah. they're better, yeah. Um, now the trajectory of this, and I don't know if this is an inevitable trajectory or not, but certainly it is the trajectory in many cases. Um, the trajectory of this as we jump forward again into the sort of 19th and 20th century, uh, is what we now refer to as eugenics, uh, which is the 19th and 20th century programs to attempt to, uh, and again, this is very unpleasant to say, but to breed human beings in a selective way, uh, to try to improve the human race by breeding some people in and some people out. And this takes all sorts of forms, um, forms like forced sterilization, which we find uh, in the Americas very commonly. And, and forced sterilization, we're not talking about things that are in the distant, distant past. 
We're talking about practices that were happening in the 20th century. And uh, I don't think I mentioned this to you yet, John, but I read an article today uh, about uh, legal, uh, legal complaints in a California prison from uh, women of color who have been uh, sterilized without their consent in, in the United States prison system right now. So even now, um, some of their, their hangovers from some of this, so forced sterilization is an example. Ghettoization is an example of like uh, putting um, uh, people of certain um, skin colors or cultural backgrounds in one region in a city or in a town or even in a country. Um, cultural and physical genocide, of course, uh, the most extreme version of this uh, in various forms across the globe. And when we say genocide, everybody's mind probably goes immediately to events like the Holocaust in Germany during World War II, which is very much an example of a genocide or an attempted genocide driven by um, uh, philosophies of racial superiority, but it's absolutely not the only one, right? There, it happens all over the globe in many, many places in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, in the 20th century, we actually have the advent of genetic science properly as we understand it now. And genetic science in the 20th century conclusively disproves any biological basis for something we call race. Um, that there is only one species of human being conclusively and that any genetic differences between uh, various groups of humans are really just regional and they're, they're just based on uh, very small subsets of humans uh, sort of being stuck together in certain parts of the globe. Uh, and there's nothing essentially different between a human being from Sub-Saharan Africa or from uh, the Arabian Peninsula or from the Mongolian steppes or from North America or from somewhere in what we call Europe, that human being is a human being is a human being. But, and there's a really important distinction, and this is sort of, I'm gonna uh, pivot over to John in a second here, but I wanna end with this important distinction. It is definitely true that there is no such thing biologically as race, but it doesn't follow that there's no such thing as race because not only biology is real, our, our societies, our cultures generate very important realities that we deal with. And we know this, uh, that we deal with these realities every day. Money is a really good example of this, right? Like money, especially now, uh, is a thing you don't need to hold in your hand. It's, it's very much an imaginary thing we all agree about. Uh, and that's how it works. That's why it's functional. Um, but it's very real. You can't pretend just because um, it, uh, it, it can't be in my hand that isn't real. It's very real. Similarly, race, while it is obviously not biologically real, it is very much socially real because of the history that I've just been outlining. It has been built into, uh, and sometimes we'll use the term a social construct or a, um, a constructed reality or a, a shared social or cultural reality. Uh, and that's the situation we're in now as we come into the beginning of the 21st century, um, pretending that race doesn't exist probably isn't an historical option for us. We need to think and talk about it a little bit. So that's sort of the history about, I mean, barely touching on colonialism uh, and talking about the development of the idea of race. But John, uh, how does Christianity and especially how does Christian mission interact with some of these dynamics and some of this history? Yeah. So. I mean, like you're saying, so there always have been like ethnic and cultural differences between people groups related to the regions they live in. So that's not made up. It's real. But this invention of this racial taxonomy or indexing of races and hierarchy is not real, but it also is a story we've told ourselves that has now shaped the world we live in, right? So that's how far we are. And now, so how does Christianity get involved in this? Well, uh, we're going to get to the Bible in a second, but just staying at the level of sort of cultural forces, these European nations that are doing all this traveling and exploring and um, settling of distant lands, their majority religions are Christianity in one form or another, right? So um, the, it's not just natural philosophers or what we would now call scientists who are doing the sense-making of the world. Um, they are, um, if there's a back and forth with theologians and church authorities in this whole process as well. And so in this process, Christianity officially and right down to the, the people sitting in the pews becomes implicated in this creation of this new cultural construct called race. Um, and so we're going to get into the biblical ways that, that Christianity, Christianity gets implicated. 
But um, some of the political ways that Christianity gets implicated come back to the story of the settling of what we now call North and South America. Because the European states are increasing in um, economic capacity, technologies, transportation powers, um, and um, they need a rationale for expansion, um, for the expansion of industry, but also of, of, of land. And this all gets intertwined with the way they make sense of the world, which is Christian religion. So there are a few key moments in here, and you'll see them on the, on the screen. Um, 1493, I think, is when the first of these um, papal bulls, or like papal orders, um, are put out. And the first, this one is called the Doctrine of Discovery, or at least we call it that now. And this is where the Pope affirms the rights of discovery um, between competing European nations. Well, the, the, how do you decide which European nation gets what land? Well, it's whoever discovered it, right? But um, notice that it's only the settlers, the new arrivals that get to be called discoverers. Well, it's not, again, it's not merely arbitrary. There's a rationale for this. And you're a discoverer if you arrive on a land and you find that it hasn't been cultivated according to European standards. And you find that it hasn't been claimed according to European standards of that day of what we would now call private property, although they didn't call it that then. And so if you arrive somewhere and no one has like a garden, <laughs> a recognizable European garden, and like uh, whatever, a flag or something on it, you know, that's, I'm being facetious, then it's discoverable. And that's a papal order. And that, so that's the Christianity getting involved. And this develops over time. So then you have other terms like terra nullius or terra incognita, which means nobody's land or land unexplored. And these are ways of similar rationale just unpacking over the ages. And again, it's all based on European standards of what a somebody is, yeah. right? It's nobody's land. Well, what's a somebody? Well, it's somebody who possesses the land and uses the land the way Europeans do. And there's also kind of like an implicit sense too, and sometimes explicit sense, right, John, that, that you sort of have to be Christian almost to qualify, that, that pagan peoples um, have a more difficult time qualifying as civilized peoples to begin with, right? Well, because they wouldn't even put it in the recognizable Christian language, which yeah. we're going to get to in a second with <clears throat> exactly. the Bible. And then you also have, you know, they get called wasted land, which is a pretty pejorative way to refer to how someone's taking care of the land that they, they um, live around and on. Um, and again, it's by European standards of what waste is versus proper use, right? And so there's all these um, front-loaded presuppositions, which we might now recognize as maybe faulty, but at the time it would have made sense to you and me, let's face it. So yeah, long story short, of course, um, when um, British and French expansion west um, comes to the, these northern lands that we're on now, um, they have had interpretive options before them. It's not like they didn't have other options, but now they're interpreting um, land and settling and discovering and land use all in these terms of um, this is land that we have discovered um, it is unreached or untamed land. It has been used in a barbaric way. And now we will civilize it in the name of the Lord. We will settle it, put it to its proper use. And this is a tragic uh, eventuality that takes decades and centuries to really, really hit the ground in, in the ultimately harmful ways. But it's right there from the beginning. Like that first papal bull is only, is the same decade as, as these lands are being disco uh, you know, discovered by Europeans. So that brings us now to the question of today's talk is like, how does the Bible explicitly get involved? Um, and we're going to talk about a few passages in scripture. Genesis 1, of course, is where a lot of this comes from. So um, I want to hear from you on this, Colin, in a sec. But just to sort of bring this even to the 20th century, it's worth noting that in 1930s Germany, the German Christian church that is going along with national so Nazi expansion um, is itself rationalizing Nazi expansion on these very same terms. Um, in fact, there's a theological explanation for the world to progress or even to be sanctified, if we can use theological language for this. Sometimes certain races or nations are going to be on the ascendancy. And it's good for the rest of the world if they expand and subdue even other races and nations. And hopefully, at least by this point, now that we turn to the Bible, you can see with us how, long story short, you can see how this 
you know, average people like you and me are frogs in a kettle sort of being slowly boiled. And it doesn't mean they're not um, responsible, each of them, as we are responsible for what we do, but you can see hopefully how the rationale just builds and builds and builds and even gets Christianized. So it's even spiritualized, right? Yeah. And this is what we have to reflect on. And the one, it's not the only thing, but the thing that is, is like the North Star for all, you know, us and all of this is the scriptures. If, if we're Christians who look to the authority of scripture, um, even, um, you know, as it says, as, as one of the later epistles says, even for correction and rebuke. Well, okay. But first, before we see how we need to be corrected by the Bible, let's get a sense now for how the Bible is implicated in all this specifically. So can you uh, pick it up at Genesis 1 for us? Yeah, yeah, because this is the issue, is that we never interpret the Bible in a vacuum, right? That the, the Bible is, of course, generating Christian theology, but it's also responding to Christian theology. And there's sort of back and forth relationship. And so this history that we've been talking about and these ideas that John has just been referring to, they feed into and are fed by certain interpretations of scripture. And so you mentioned Genesis 1, which is a good place to start. Um, Genesis 1 and the command to subdue all of the earth. So this is Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30. Uh, which you've got up on your screen there, let them have dominion over the land, let them be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. That language from Genesis chapter one, right at the very end of the, of the opening creation narrative in the first chapter. Um, this is interpreted for much of European Christianity as a command to control and to cultivate the land. And it's very much present in those 17th to 19th century colonial conversations. So for example, and I'm just gonna give you, this is, um, this is just one very specific example, but it's a very representative example. So this is consistent with what you see all over the place in these conversations. But let's, let's look at a 19th century example here in this land that we now call Canada. Um, the literature of the late 19th century in what we now call Canada tended to mischaracterize the people, the indigenous people who lived on the plains and the prairies, people like the Plains Cree, as lazy or immoral people due to their semi-nomadic economy. We're talking about peoples who had been on this land for centuries, uh, millennia probably in some, some cases, um, but they're, uh, they are not leaving what Europeans consider the appropriate marks of civilization. Uh, and you'll see literature well, where um, European settlers and explorers will come and they'll say that the land is untouched or that the land is, is barren or bare. Um, and the fact that there are, especially that there are no large scale, scale cultivated farms. Um, because it's true, the Plains Creed did not actually engage in lots of large scale agriculture. Probably, uh, we actually have some um, archeological evidence that, that several hundred years ago, there were some large scale um, agriculture in, in various places on the, uh, on the North American plains. But by the time we're in the 19th century and Europeans are exploring the region, it's not that common. What you mostly have is a semi-nomadic economy where you have people like the Plains Cree or the Blackfoot um, who are following the migration of the buffalo or they're, um, they're engaging with other migrating animals. Uh, and they are living um, a very stable, very economically generative uh, and relatively safe life, but they're moving around a lot. They don't own a lot of possessions in the way that Europeans understand right. possessions because of course they gotta, they're they moving all the time, right? You've, if you gotta get up and pack and walk or ride long distances to follow the buffalo herd, you, you don't wanna have a giant house filled with things. Right? Isn't it one, like part of your relationship to the land is precisely not to leave a mark? And that's one of the fundamental cultural differences right. you'll get between the Cree, for example, and the European settlers. The European settlers see leaving a mark on the land as like the synchronon of civilization. Right. But the, the Crees just fundamentally disagree. They, they think that living in harmony and not leaving marks on the land, taking what is necessary, uh, that that's sort of how you live uh, in, in, a, in a good relationship with creation. Um, and, but it isn't, uh, at, we can look back now and say, it isn't obvious that one of those uh, is correct and one of them is incorrect, but for European settlers, it was very obvious. And that one's Genesis correct, one's 1 is implicated there? In well, Genesis 1 has that passage to, to come and to subdue and to multiply and fill right. the earth, especially that term to have dominion and to subdue. Those two terms uh, are really heavily interpreted by European Christians to mean to cultivate the land. 
to build cities, to have, and, and it gets attached to agriculture more than anything. And when we say agriculture, we mean relatively large scale agriculture, uh, very fixed agriculture. Uh, that All of that gets put together um, as, uh, as the fundamental Christian and human responsibility. And so if you come across a group of people who are not doing these things and they're not living up to the best of humanity and it becomes used as evidence by the European settlers that European settlers are superior at an intrinsic level to the indigenous populations that you find in the Canadian plain. And so how does this get racialized specifically? Right. And so this is the next step. Let's jump ahead a couple of chapters in Genesis to Genesis chapter four and Genesis chapter nine, which are two passages that actually people still kind of mix up sometimes. So Genesis chapter four is the story of Cain and Abel, right? We have these two brothers uh, and, uh, and God asked them to bring a sacrifice and God likes one of the sacrifices better than the other. Abel's sacrifice is received by God. It's a very odd passage. And then Cain gets really upset and he murders his brother. Uh, and then God discovers he's murdered his brother and, uh, and he's gonna send Cain out as sort of a wanderer in, in the world because of this, as punishment for this. And Cain says, you can't do this, I'll die. And people will take retribution on me. And so God, it says that God places a mark on Cain. Now that's all it says, the Hebrew word here is oath. It's just a sign or, or a mark or something, some kind of signifier. Uh, the text does not expand upon that right. at all. But this is something that's get, that gets interpreted by um, uh, sort of 16th, 17th, 18th century uh, European Christians increasingly start to identify the mark of Cain with skin color yeah. and especially with darker skin color. Yeah. Uh, because again, lighter, better, darker, worse. And so because Cain is a bad guy, he gets associated with uh, with this skin tone characteristic, with blackness, essentially, or with darkness. So that's one piece of the puzzle. But we need to also jump ahead to Genesis chapter 9, which is a, a very different story, but it has uh, an, another person gets marked here, right? So we have two people getting marked. We have the mark of Cain in Genesis 4, and we have the mark of Ham, or the curse of Ham, or Canaan. This is, this is after the flood. This is after the flood, yeah. So we have the flood, right? The earth is destroyed in the flood. And after the flood, it's just Noah and his family um, and his sons. And he has three sons. He has Shem, he has Japheth or Yatheth in Hebrew, uh, and he has Ham, his youngest son. And there's this really weird story uh, that, that frankly, biblical scholars still really struggle with because it's a very peculiar story where Noah gets drunk and he passes out and Ham sees his nakedness, the text says. And then he goes and reports this to his brother and uh, to his brothers, and then um, uh, Noah gets really mad about that. For again, this is it's a confusing story. We're not exactly sure what happened. Uh, and then he curses. Intriguingly, he doesn't curse Ham. He curses Ham's son Canaan, uh, this his son to be, who's sort of in Genesis. Canaan is the progenitor of the Canaanite people who live in the same region as the Israelite people. Um, and this this curse that's referred to in Genesis chapter nine, verse twenty-five, the curse of uh, of Canaan or the curse of Ham, depending on who you talk to, it becomes again associated with the people of the African continent. And you'll get, not uniformly, but in some versions of the story in Europe, um, Shem will be associated with the Semitic people. So the Jewish people and other Semitic nations. Um, Japheth or Japheth will become associated with European Christians because Japheth sort of gets a blessing here. And then Shem, or Ham and his son Canaan become associated with the African people. Uh, and so then we have now, you, you conflate these two stories, the mark of Cain, which is blackness, and this curse of Canaan, which is, relent, which is related to being a slave or a servant. So if you look on, uh, on the screen, we've got Genesis 9, 27 there. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. So there, if you're interpreting Japheth as Europeans, and Canaan or Ham or Canaan as um, the African peoples, then we've got, now we combine that with the mark of Cain and blackness. And now we have the beginnings of what one scholar, a guy named Whitford calls a curse matrix. And he identifies a few things, uh, some, some common features that European Christians will identify, uh, will use to identify especially African people, but also people from other non-European nations right on this hierarchy that we've been talking about. There's three things especially identified with, uh, with African people. 
uh, blackness as a curse, right? So skin color is a curse. And the curse specifically is that now you will serve the other races. Yeah, and that's the that and that's that's the specific curse that's the specific the verse, curse yeah. in Genesis nine. So Genesis four, blackness is your curse. Genesis nine, you're going to be a slave, which is the consequence of the curse. Those things get stuck together. So blackness as an identifier of a race that is a race again that is made for slavery. Uh, pretty, it's pretty dangerous stuff here and there's so much slippage too because the curse oh, yeah. was on canaan specifically but now it's expanded to ham and everything ham represents. and everything ham represents yeah. even though the text itself actually doesn't, doesn't make say that at all. all yeah yeah the text never makes this move never associates this with skin color or even really with the region of africa if you go read the text carefully that's not really part of how it plays out um so it's lots of, we're, we're taking lots of license yeah. with the text here the second thing Whitford identifies in this, um, this matrix that he's talking about, so blackness, the second one is what he calls the hypersexual African. And this is associated with some of these interpretations of this weird Ham story, um, because Ham sees his father's nudity and some European Christians um, identify this as um, uh, a story about sexuality in some sense, uh, uh, whether it's incest or homosexuality or something, something sexually distasteful has happened, according to these uh, European Christians. So now they're associating this with uh, all of a sudden everybody who lives on the African continent right. becomes this, dangerous. Yeah, dangerous, hypersexualized individual. The maligning of an entire continent full of people, yeah. connecting them to Ham's supposed sexual sin, yeah. even though the text itself is not clearly about that. And then finally, the third thing that Whitford throws into the pile here, which John's talked about a little bit already, is uh, the notion of Christianization. The responsibility of Christians to Christianize everybody else in the world. Now, non-white people, especially in Africa, but non-white people everywhere are tagged as quote unquote enemies of Christ. Uh, and Christianization includes not only proselytization, not only telling people about Christianity, but it actually gets expanded to include conquering other nations and enslaving non-white people for the purpose of Christianizing them. Yeah. And all sorts of complicated kind of messy things uh, um, happen in them, uh, in there. And we could, we, could, we could get into those weeds if we wanted to. Maybe people have questions about that. And we can talk about that. Um, but, uh, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to we'll, we'll fast forward. Yeah, yeah. We'll fast forward a little bit. There's lots to talk about here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to the new Testament. Okay. Uh, I'm skipping a couple of paragraphs here because we could talk forever about yeah. this. Um, there are some slavery texts in the new Testament and especially, uh, so these slavery texts in the new Testament are, are leveraged heavily by European Christians. They're especially leveraged heavily, heavily by slaveholding Christians in the United States of America during the period of slavery. Of, of chattel slavery there. Um, some specific passages we could point to would be Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9, Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 4, verse 1. Those two passages are basically parallel. Ephesians and Colossians are almost identical. And then Paul's letter to Philemon uh, is another example of this. These three texts were regularly used to reinforce the notion that slavery is natural and acceptable, because in those texts, Paul specifically tells slaves to obey their earthly masters, right? And, and all of the emphasis in those texts gets placed on, oh, slaves, obey your earthly masters as you obey the Lord. Uh, people very often forget the next section, which is, uh, which is a command to masters to be kind and generous or to treat their slaves as brothers or sisters in Christ. That part gets left off a lot. Um, or turn into a kind of patronizing. Or turn into yeah. a kind of like, yeah, you can be, you're like the father to yeah. this, to these slaves that you... Uh, that you are ruling over. So these are regularly used to sort of naturalize slavery. Uh, and of course, none of those passages have anything to do with ethnicity or with cultural heritage or what, what, what is, we're calling race, right. but they get racialized, yeah. right? They, it becomes natural because it gets connected to all that Genesis stuff. Um, and this is, of course, like it's a misunderstanding of what Greco-Roman slavery was like historically, um, but it's also a, a misunderstanding of these texts. These texts are actually not pro-slavery if you read them carefully. If you read them carefully, they are kind of anti-slavery. Paul is making, um, I always read this as Paul is making kind of unwilling concessions uh, to the culture that he happens to be a part of at the time. And Philemon is especially a big clue in that front yeah. because he really is putting a guilt trip on the slave owner that Paul is sending back this slave named Onesimus who's become a Christian. Uh, and, and Paul says, I really want you to treat this, this man like, a, like your brother in Christ. And so there is sort of a, a leveraging of that Christian relationship. And whatever we think about whether Paul 
approved of slavery or not, it wasn't racialized in the texts. It was never, and, and because it wasn't racialized in the Greco-Roman Empire, uh, the slavery was common, but it had a lot more to do with either, either were taken as a slave in war or, or with debt slavery. You, you ran out of money and you had to sell yourself into indentured servitude. Those are sort of more common ways you become a slave. Uh, it wasn't really indexed to what we call race because there wasn't really a concept of race as we understand it at that time. And so out of all of this, you get this truly toxic and disastrous mixture of racism and then the conflation and misinterpretation of those Genesis texts and those New Testament texts about slavery. And out of that, you get um, really extensive Christian um, justification of the North Atlantic slave trade as, mm -hmm. it, as we understood it. Now, that was all pretty bad news. Right. Yeah. And it's not all bad news. Right. Because it isn't 100 percent negative about how the Bible has been used. John, can you talk to us a little bit about um, other ways that the Bible has been used throughout history in this conversation? Yeah. And so not not at all to downplay. Yeah. The, the fact that Christians have been implicated and the Bible has been implicated in the support of all kinds of evils, um, which we now recognize as evil e easily. But Christians like us would not have quickly said that. Yep. And probably you and I sitting in those days would have also gone along with this. We have Very to recognize possible. that sobering fact. But it's one, one thing you often hear is that people back then didn't know any better. But here's the thing, like, there were always prophets, yep. there was always dissent. And actually, the Bible was used um, to argue against these moves as well. So yes, people were going along with majority interpretations and majority, you know, what was called science at the time. But they were there. We, we have to remember, and we, we can't forget, that there always were dissenters. Um, whether their voices got squashed um, is, is a whole thing, but there was dissent. So the Bible has um, been on the sort of uh, the dissenting side as well, um, which shows how malleable it can be in our hands, right? Which is why we have to pay such careful attention to our interpretation, right? And so on. So it was implicated, and we're going to refer a lot here to an author by the name of Willie Jennings, because he's done a lot of good work on this in the last um, decade. I think a decade ago is when his big book came out. But he called all this sort of this interpretive grid that people slowly learn to use to distort these biblical texts. He calls this now, in retrospect, a diseased social imagination, right? And it just all, everything compiles, and it becomes this distorted imagination of how the world should work, this story we tell ourselves, this cultural construct. And the effects of it are lasting. It's not like you can just snap your fingers and end it. Because once this story shapes these cultures and the way Europeans settle the world and racialize everyone, it leaves a, it leaves a mark, speaking of marks, and he calls it the colonial wound. But he also traces, and others, plenty of others have traced it, the dissent. And so just let me just read some quotes. Just again, long story short, just dabbling in the centuries, some examples of dissent that people would have been able to get their hands on in these different periods. So we have Gerard Win 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 Stanley in uh, England in 1649 in a tract called The New Law of Righteousness. He's opposing all sorts of things going on in England at the time. But one of the things he says is that in the beginning of time, God made the earth. Not one word was spoken at the beginning that one branch of mankind should rule over another. But selfish imaginations did set up one man to teach and rule over another. And Wynne Stanley was a part of a group that we would now probably call charismatics. <laughs> they were actually um, sort of dismissed by the, the sort of proper English church people of the time as a little bit uh, wild, but the levelers and the diggers, and they were releasing pamphlets that were resisting all these moves. So that's one dissenter who used the Bible and, and theology of those same texts to oppose what was going on. Frederick Douglass um, wrote an, uh, one of the earliest and only uh, narratives on, on the from the perspective of a slave in 1845. And he talked about how he hoped that when one of his slave masters became a Christian, he would be more kind, but actually it made him more cruel because now he had God on his side, right? And religion, um, the worst ma slave masters of all were the religious ones because they could like reify or, or have God behind everything they did, have a sort of theological rationale. And, he's, and he observes, and this is again in print publication that, um, Christian slave masters covered their infernal business with the garb of Christianity. And this, you know, and so this, along with Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin in the mid 1800s, got picked up by abolitionists um, to oppose slavery. And these voices were out there. And then even more recently in, in the 20th century in Canada, bringing this close to home, even uh, when the residential school system, which we're going to talk about a little bit before we're done, 
even when it was getting kicked off and, and was in its early decades. Um, uh, one fellow by the name of Frank Oliver, who was a superintendent general of, of what was called Indian Affairs at the time, he said, he stood up and he said, I hope you'll excuse me for so speaking, but one of the most important commandments laid upon the human by the divine is love and respect by children for parents. So it seems strange that in the name of religion, a system of education should have been instituted, the founding principle of which not only ignores, but contradicts this command. So just examples of how, well, you know, there were opportunities to know better at the time with these very same texts. Yeah. But that brings us maybe around to, okay, this is really sobering. Um, none of this has totally gone away. We had better learn, relearn and unlearn um, our use of the Bible. So Willie Jennings, again, um, is one of many scholars in the last decades, last century, really, who have really picked up this mantle and um, offered to us a Christian sort of reimagination of how this all should have and, and should, should get reworked. And so some highlights of how biblical texts can be revisited, um, just to name a few, a few things. So if we go back again to Genesis, we can think of the Babel story, the Tower of Babel or Babel. And there we see that the people who in a chapter or two earlier had been recommanded after the flood to scatter over the earth. They're now gathering in one place to make a name for themselves or to sort of build an empire for themselves is how I read it. And rather than scatter um, and fill the earth and God confuses their language, which is seen by us as a curse, but in a certain sense, it's just getting them back on track as Jennings read it, reads it, um, getting them to scatter again. And the implication of scattering is they're gonna diversify across the earth, right? As yep. it goes right back to Genesis one. Fast forward again, we're skipping like most of the Bible, but like <laughs> just, you know, pick up the New Testament. And when we get to the story of Pentecost, which is so hugely important, Jennings has this fascinating reading of, of Pentecost saying that in a way, Pentecost is the church um, being fueled by the spirit to um, almost pick up the scattering of Babel and, and see its redemption. So it's not a curse. It's a blessing for us to be scattered and diversified. And signals of this in Acts are all through the book of Acts, but even just the first two chapters, if you look at them, you've got the Great Commission, which Jesus gave in, in several of the Gospels, is reiterated in Acts according to regions. Yeah. You know, there's a note, you're noticing you're going to go into different regions and even to the ends of the earth. And then in Acts 2, the sign of Pentecost is the tongues. And in this case, it's not ecstatic prayer language, it's actual languages. And we know that because people hear the disciples um, starting to speak and the disciples don't know what they're saying. That's the miracle. But people have come from all over and they say, we hear the wonders of God in our own tongues. And um, Jennings is, is really cool on this because he says, okay, this is a miracle, but it's not a one-off. It's a sign to us of what our mission is now. Um, and that is, you know, if, if this is about anything, it's about G the wonders of God being spoken on every tongue on earth. And in fact, you are like those stupefied disciples. You won't even know if the gospel has been spread until those other cultures and languages are able to say back to you, oh, we, uh, we, we speak the wonders of God in our own tongues. And with mm -hmm. tongues, with languages comes culture. Yeah. Right. Um, there's going to be a give and take in there. And, and where we got this wrong as white people is there's way too much give and not enough receive, right? And Jennings wants to recalibrate the social imagination around this Pentecost sign, the sign of the mission. And it just right through Acts, the disciples are getting to a new place and discovering the spirit is ahead of them. Yeah. And they've got to, you know, learn to talk about Jesus in these new languages. And at the end of the Re of Revelation, if we want to fast forward to the end of time, <laughs> One of the great things at the end of the apocalyptic vision is that at the end of history, we will have the healing of the nations, of the ethnos, right? All uh, nations come into the city, but it isn't like everybody's uh, not homogenous. A, no, it's they're not eliminated yeah. or assimilated, yeah. which is how the European vision got shaped. Yep. And so what does that look like? And, you know, more importantly, as we sort of transition to sort of personal effects and Q&A here, how do we live now between this, this, you know, the sign of Pentecost going all the way back to the creation command mandates? How do we undistort them and recalibrate our, our vision? Um, all of us together, but our, particularly as white people. Yeah. So let's try to bring this down to land and then we'll take questions. Um, each of us is going to just mention a couple of things maybe that we think uh, really hits us, hits us on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think if I'm thinking about the things that have been 
challenging to me and I'm trying to think through. Um, and here I am sort of speaking for myself, but I, but I think this is something that matters to all of us. Um, one thing that I, I hear relatively commonly is the notion that, um, uh, that we can't apologize for the sins of the past or something right. like that. Um, but I, I actually, in here, I want to point to a couple of places in scripture. Um, that's not quite the best way I think of understanding what, what repentance maybe means. So if we think, for example, to give a, a first example, think about the Israelites returning back to Jerusalem after the exile. Uh, and in Nehemiah 9, they've rebuilt the temple and they're rededicating the temple. And at the outset of, uh, of the rededication of the temple, the Israelites, it says the Israelites stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their ancestors. So the Israelites are standing there at the rededication of the temple. And uh, this is the author of Nehemiah telling us that they are looking back to the pre-exilic period and to the idolatry and failures of the pre-exilic period. Uh, and nobody present is really responsible. Like it's been yeah. a generation and a half of the people who are really responsible are dead basically. Yeah. And so the, but the people who are there recognize that multi-generational sin leaves a mark on us. Uh, it leaves a mark on us individually, but it leaves a mark, a mark on us as, as cultures as well. And that we actually can, and in fact should, engage in versions of corporate confession and repentance. So when we say, when we talk about a need for um, reconciliation and repentance, uh, I wasn't present uh, as a Christian teacher during a lot of the history we're talking about, but I, I am a member of the Christian church. And the Christian church is this, this sort of, uh, this body that transcends time and space. And so in a certain sense, I was there, right? Yeah. And, I, and I do bear responsibility. And I also, I've benefited from, uh, in, in my whiteness and in the privileges that I have because of that, I've benefited from some of those injustices. So I need to reckon with that. And mm -hmm. that's important to me. So then what does repentance start to look like yeah. for us? Yeah. So and I think that one of the things we, we need to say is, um, is we need to find a way to move beyond I'm not racist, which might be true. Like personally, <laughs> I don't feel racist. Toward, that, that might be true. It might not be true. I don't know uh, of any individual. In person. terms of like an attitude. Or an, an attitude intense, or intention. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times when people say, I'm not, I don't mean to be, to be racist, which, which may be true. I don't and That's know not really that. what this is about. But that's not what we're trying to talk about yeah. necessarily. It's not that it's entirely unimportant, but what if we shift the, um, the nature of the question a little bit instead, instead of saying, am I racist or not? Let's say, am I responsible to combat racism? And there, I think that the Christian vision is pretty clear that I am, right? If this is an evil in the world, uh, and it, and it, it flows against God's uh, desire, good desire that we've tried to outline in scripture, then I think it is something that I'm responsible for. And by racism for. here, you mean like this whole cultural cons construct yeah. of race that we benef we are the beneficiaries of as yeah. white men. I don't mean just individual yes. attitudes. I'm talking about, and we sometimes use the, use the term here, systemic racism, right. right? We talk about systems. And all we mean by that is systemic racism is an attempt to recognize that regardless of my personal intentions, I might be participating in social systems or stories or histories or structures that have a racist history and that perpetuate some version of those racial injustices. So this is not an attempt to say everybody is racist or something like that, uh, but to admit that many of us benefit from unjust systems and some of those unjust systems are tied to racist logic. Um, and we need to have serious cultural conversations about that, right? And there are really serious cultural conversations happening out there. We, if you guys want to talk about like critical race theory or BLM or any of these things that are happening in the culture right now, that's absolutely something we can talk about. And then the last thing I'm going to say sort of related to that, as I, as I sort of kick this over to John, is, um, is the issue of what sometimes gets called colorblindness. Uh, I don't see color. I'm not racist. I'm I not don't racist. see color. Right? I don't see color. Everybody's the same to me. Okay. So I appreciate the sentiment of that. I do. Uh, people mean to say, I see all of my fellow human beings as a fellow human being, which and that's a good sentiment to gain. But there's a fairly big but here. <laughs> um, the issue of the pretense of colorblindness is that it consequently gives us license to ignore those systemic issues right. and the experience of people who have been racialized. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the really sobering things for me has been to sit down with my my friends who are people of color uh, or indigenous people, and they will say to me, uh, I don't want you to ignore my color. Right. I don't want you to pretend I'm not black. I am black. 
And I'm not, a, I'm not apologizing for being black. I love my, uh, my history and my culture. And so I don't, I don't wanna be colorblind. I wanna recognize these people uh, for the beautiful um, history, cultural heritage, uh, the language that they have to offer. So it isn't about neutrality. It's about um, recognizing um, one another as uh, that sort of beautiful diversity that you were talking about in Acts. So and, what, what about you? Well, for people like you and me, colorblindness is really convenient because then yeah. I can ignore the way that my particular color or lack thereof, or almost, I'm almost translucent. <laughs> so like, uh, it gives me a pass on really being aware or facing the ways that um, I have inherited privileges that others have. And so mm -hmm. I was really helped by a book by Christina Cleveland called Disunity in Christ, where she talked about the problem of colorblindness and then another problem, which is power blindness, which yeah. is just when you as a white, typically white men, we just um, will not be aware unless we pay attention to what people are telling us of the privileges we've had. And especially so when you're, you worked really hard to get where you at. Like I've, yeah. you know, I, you know, worked my butt off to get here, right? Yeah. And uh, against all obstacles, I don't have privilege. Well, imagine if you were indigenous or English as a second language immigrant or a person of color, mm -hmm. a woman, add all those things up, those intersections of identity. Yeah, you had privileges, right? And so, so there's one thing for me to notice those or be aware of those. But then in everyday realities, I carry privileges even in meetings because we're still enculturated to defer to our, our own white male voices, which again, it comes back to how we started. We frankly kind of apologize for centering to white male voices here today. What we mostly wanna do is pivot and say, look, we have privileges. We wanna say, we wanna own up to this history yeah. and stuff. And this is all part of repentance. So we're gonna to come to questions and answers now, but just besides um, in scripture, throughout the Christian tradition, there have just been example after example of um, the fact that, you know, as it says in the first of the 95 theses that kicked off the Protestant Reformation, the entirety of life is to be an act of repentance. We shouldn't be thrown off by our need to repent in crises like we are facing now, but like every day, it should almost yeah. be like breathing for us. So yeah, we got to repent every day, like big time. So what? Like, welcome to Christianity. But then also at like <laughs> serious, um, uh, crisis moments such as like the Bethel Confession as an example in the Barman Declaration in Nazi Germany, Christians having to say, look, we repent. And one of those examples is on the screen or even in 20th century and 21st century Canada, churches that were directly involved in the residential schools and the abuse of indigenous peoples on this land have made formal apologies, confessions, repentances. And frankly, we need to be a part of that, not just in well, both and, both in um, institutional and churchly acts of maybe repeated public repentance, serious, have taken seriously and listened first and then found the words for it that take seriously the abuses and, and victimizations and the legacies of wounds that exist, but then also the follow through, right? And so I'll leave it with this, but in, um, there has been a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, which I'm still alarmed by how, you know, how many of us have not actually read or or, or really encountered it. And it was public, the findings were published in 2015. There were 94 calls to action and only, I think you can count them on one hand. It's like four. Five or six were, yeah. were for churches specifically. Yeah. Um, some were specifically churches were called to respond to the abuse of indigenous peoples in this land with particular actions. But then there were two that were just to all of us, religious people of faith generally. And on the screen, you'll see number 49, which says, you know, they call upon all religious people and faith groups to repudiate these doctrines. Yeah. You know, and of course the specific ones and the papal bulls are part of that, but it's like the whole sweep of this that we Christianized. And that repudiation has to go on in our hearts and minds. Colorblindness and powerblindness are things we have to revoke. And we're learning this on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So like when this is over, we're going to go back to, we're out of teaching mode and we're listening to people of color, indigenous voices. How do we... Uh, reconstitute this place around you rather than around us. Yep. Um, and you know, leave it with this, Ray Aldred, an excellent article in this book that you'll see on screen. He talked about how repentance was taught to indigenous people as, as a thing they had to do. They had to repent of their indigenousness, their right? of their culture. Yeah. And they learned self-hate. You had to be self-hating. You had to become white to be a Christian, which is a lose-lose situation because 
you know, you, you can't jump out of the skin that we're indexing you by, yeah. right? And but so repentance for indigenous peoples means learning not to hate themselves. <laughs> and repentance for non-indigenous people needs to mean entering into shared narrative where we hear from mm -hmm. um, the peoples of the earth yeah. that have been disadvantaged by this whole story so that um, we can be forgiven by them. And that's maybe sounds odd if we think of, you can only be forgiven if you actually did the thing yourself in the first place. But again, back to these Old Testament texts, yeah, you know, forgive us as we forgive each other is yeah. a daily reality for us. And this is the, this is our commitment really to alumni and to each other. And, and we invite those of you watching, we're really glad you're taking part in this, to join us in this kind of relearning of, of what it means to be Christians in this world yeah. without ignoring the things we have to unlearn along the way. Is that about say it? Yeah. Really? Okay. Perfectly for me. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's heavy. Right? Right? We want to acknowledge that this is heavy. Yeah. yeah, but always we, want, we also want to stop talking and give a yeah. chance for some people, as promised, um, absolutely, to voice some questions through our moderators. So I guess we'll do that now. Yeah, sure. I think we'll we have about lead. twenty minutes or so, according to their commitments. So, I hope so. Um, yeah. Well, thanks so much, guys. We have a lot of uh, kind of think comments okay. coming in that really appreciate this conversation, and so uh, some of the there's there's a number um, that you kind of talked about directly that go back kind of to scriptural questions sure. or around race. Um, and then I want to get to really, there's a number on how to kind of move this conversation forward in the church and like, what can we do, whether that's no matter where we are as Christians, how do we live this out? Um, uh, so a couple, a couple that came in early, uh, kind of one question, uh, it seemed over a few questions, kind of putting them together for time. Uh, is looking at kind of that early stages of Genesis. Uh, one is, does race go back to Genesis, Genesis 10 and that table of nations? Right. And, uh, and wasn't Noah a descendant of Seth, not Cain? So how does, how does that tie together in um, that discussion? Right. Old Testament, yeah. Hebrew scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So the first thing I'm going to say is it's, a, it's really important to understand the, the, the literary purpose of the, the so-called table of nations and, um, and things like the, um, uh, things like the genealogies that you find all through Genesis, the Genesis filled with genealogies and it's got that table of nations. Um, these all fill, and, and there's a technical word we use for this in biblical studies, a fancy word. These have an etiological purpose. But what that basically means is um, this was an attempt by the authors of these texts. Now, keep in mind, the authors of Genesis don't live in this period. They live, they live long. This is, the, this is ancient, 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 deep, 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 deep history. This is like mythical ancestral history for them. This is, the, these texts are usually attempts to explain who everybody is in the neighborhood. Right. Because when we, when we get these texts, what we're getting is uh, the Edomites live over there, right? And the Moabites live over there and the Canaanites live over there and the Hittites live up there. Who are these people? And the table of nations and the other genealogies, uh, the genealogies are mostly the Israelites saying, who, who are we? Right. Where do we come from? And the table of nations is trying to answer the question, what's our relationship to these various other tribal groups that are around us? But it's super important for us to understand that the notion of race that we've been talking about, right, of like fundamental essential differences between kinds of human, that's not part of this conversation. And in These, fact, the table of nations are actually drawing them all back to a common source rather than... Yeah. yeah One right. of the assumptions of all these people in this area, first of all, you got to remember how small of a region we're talking about. Like we're, we, we usually use the geographical term, the Levant, when we talk about this area, but we're basically talking about this, this little sliver of land between the Anatolian Peninsula where modern day Turkey is and down in, in, uh, in Egypt, in North Africa, this liver, little sliver of land, um, it, it has a lot of people and a lot of different ethnic groups that live there, but they're all very closely related to one another. And they saw each other as sort of cousins, close cousins mostly. And the, the table of nations isn't there to emphasize um, the, the differences necessarily. It's actually kind of there to emphasize that we all are, that, that, you're, that the Canaanite who lives over there is, is part of your common ancestry, but there's a complicated family relationship, yeah. right? We're, and, and a lot of the wars are explained as sort of like complicated, families complicated, right. long-term uh, family uh, um, anger and violence and, and, you know, dysfunction 
that's sort of what those stories were. In terms about. of the mark of Cain and the mark of Ham, I think in our fast forwarding, it maybe sounds like we those two stories went together, but those are just two different ways. Yeah. Right. Well, that and that's people, one of the ironies is is they those two stories get jammed together. Even though, like the question has noticed, yeah, they don't really belong. Cain together. doesn't connect to him. Yeah, exactly. Directly. They don't actually belong together. Right. They get jammed together by European Christians in various ways, but it's not actually a very close or careful reading of the text. It's, it's the kind of thing you can get away in preaching where you, <laughs> people don't necessarily notice if you've... <laughs> people haven't the, read the genealogy. Everybody skips the genealogies of the Table of Nations when they read it. It's right. the most important part of Genesis, I yeah. tell people. No, but that's a good show. Like, yeah. those stories don't necessarily have to cohere, but they did sort of get jumbled up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's super important on both ends. Yeah. Great. Hopefully that gets us there. Lee, do you got another one for us? Yeah, definitely. So uh, there's a few that more general community. How do you, when you're, when you're out hanging out with your friends or you're, you're out and about and you, you're kind of interacting with people. In the uh, olden days, yeah. Kind of, <laughs> how's a good way to approach this? And like, do you guys have any kind of suggestions on it. as a Christian, how do we move this conversation forward and draw attention to it? Um, uh, in a sense, should we acknowledge this? Ex our, uh, mm, that's, that's my next one. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. like yeah. the big one is so, so this one person, I'll just read straight from theirs and stop trying to combine them all. all right. What can, a, a, what can Christianity uniquely contribute to the in the resistance of racism. As a young adult, do I have to fully subscribe to the movements or organizations of Black Lives Matter, et cetera, or to start making it, how, and how do I do that to start making a difference? I could speak to the, when I'm in the streets kind of thing, and yeah, then sure. maybe you could speak to the movements and yeah, all. Yeah, sure, okay. that works for me. Um, I'm talking here as a person who's very much still learning this. Um, particularly when you get in a position as a teacher, you, you get used to this idea that people should listen to you. And uh, you have to remember that there's a lot of times where you should just admit you don't have a clue what you're talking about and be quiet and listen. And there's almost this learned reflex where both in the classroom actually and um, hallways and as, you know, in the good old days when we used to go to restaurants and stuff, be a learner, right? And, yeah. uh, and be willing to unlearn things and even just to be become aware of your own premises or blind spots. Um, and that's humbling, but um, it, it sort of gets more comfortable, especially if you can just admit it up front. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was um, pastoring in a, a church where we shared a building with a Chinese church and just so many times I had to be willing to ask an ignorant question rather than pretend to be all knowing or act colorblind, just say, hey, when we use this room this way and you use it that way, I don't understand why we're different. Can you tell me why we do this different? And, and, and I learn mm -hmm. not only how others are and, and act, which is totally legit and actually probably more sensible than the way I use the room. But also, I learn my own front loaded like presuppositions about life and I start to see myself in a new light. And there are times where that hurts to find things out about yourself and your, your presumptions that you carry. And it also hurts to realize that you've been speaking over people that have been spoken over by people like, like us. That hurts to realize that. But again, get used to it. Like get used to having to admit, oh, I did it. Can I apologize and ask you to tell me your story? And that actually gets exciting over time because especially because if you like learning, which we didn't get into this just to blab, but yeah. to learn, learning is great. It is. Learning about difference is great. And that's what we can, I don't know if it's uniquely Christian, but in terms of neighbor love and, and Christian and Christ, that's as Jennings put it, be willing to be hosted rather than always having to be the host. I don't know if it's uniquely Christian, but it's definitely intrinsically. It is Christian. It's it definitely be. intrinsically Christian. Right, right? Right, yeah, right, it's definitely right. Christian. Yeah, no, today I learned I learned today, and I don't, I haven't looked up to see how true this is or not, but um, uh, a Kainai gentleman that I follow on Twitter said something about uh, the origins of the, the name of the Blackfoot Nation. And, uh, and I, I asked, you know, what, that, what, what that's about. And, and, uh, and he said uh, that the nation is named after, uh, uh, they, they used to burn parts of the grasslands to motivate the buffalo to migrate in certain patterns. And so they would get the nickname Blackfoot because they would have black feet from the ash. That's 
That was cool. It was a, it was just a moment to learn. That was a beautiful thing to learn a new thing about a culture that I live really close to. Yeah, and I want to ask you about. Sorry, no, you know, no. Go ahead. I want to ask you about Black Lives Matter and, and yeah. different movements in a sec. But just to stay with this for a second, I don't know. Maybe you have stories like this too. But um, even just thinking of that same scenario, I was in a church sharing the building. We would do things with the Chinese church in the same building, and we would start talking about, well, can we do more things together? And to realize for us to do things together, I was in more of a rush to do that than they were because they knew that if we did things together, we would do it the white way. Yeah. You know, we're all Canadians, right? Um, but that's why I'm saying it that way. It's just, you know, even though we all sort of go to Tim Hortons sometimes, although probably I do that more than, than they, I had to slow down and be like, yeah. okay, we're going to do this. First of all, we need to learn right, how to coexist in this space, like, um, not necessarily on my terms. So sorry, I hit the mic there. <laughs> um, and then also to just enjoy going to um, meals together, yep. and just being taught, yep. not just um, about different cultures and ways of eating, but how silly my eating habits are. And I know you're like a chef, but I will eat macaroni <laughs> every day if, if I'm if I don't have people to feed. I, I could just food, to, but I like junk to have food, people so. laugh at you is it's kind of nice actually after a while once you get used to it and just to learn <laughs> your difference, you know. So I don't know. I'm yeah. rambling about. No, that, no. But. I I really agree about this. I think one of the big things you're picking up here that I think is super important for this question is. Um, there is a habit of that we sometimes have of being defensive. Yeah. Right. That like if somebody says, uh, "Man, that was a real white thing to say," or that was a really insensitive, uh, or you really centered yourself, we get real upset or defensive about that, which is understandable at one level, but also at another level, that defensiveness doesn't really serve anything. And at a certain level, you got to try to listen to others, right, and really try to honestly hear other people's stories. Now, the one caveat I'll give to that is uh, do, I, I think it's probably good practice to try to avoid like cornering yeah. your indigenous friend or right. your black or brown friend and saying, yeah. hey, could you explain right. explain yeah. indigenous settler relations in Canada for me? That's, that's probably not cool, right? It's not really their responsibility to educate you. Right. There's an internet. There's books. There's yeah. books. Get, it, get out there and read some yeah. things. But if it's more like, hey, I'm super interested in, in, your, in your culture and your history. Can you tell me some stories? Most people are real keen on that. And, and just listen, be a big listener and try to find lots of voices to listen to. Now, the other part of the question was about like, um, like cultural movements, right? Like Black Lives Matter, Matter is one that people point to a lot or um, uh, movements uh, toward decolonization sometimes is a, in a Canadian context, we'll hear things like that. Issues about uh, treaty, treaty and inherent rights for indigenous people in North America um critical race theory all the these are all kind of big ideas and buzzwords that are floating around they become buzzwords but there's also yeah broad movements and then there's also like organizations sometimes yeah so, so it's well, like the first thing I, i'm going to say here is give yourself permission to accept the fact that this is complicated right, <laughs> right. It, it's it, and you don't have to be an expert on it overnight and it takes a lot of work and time and effort um but also take some responsibility for your learning too right. and spend some time. So just to give one example, so I think, I think Black Lives Matter was, was part of the question. So just let's use BLM as an as a, as a example here. So BLM is both an organization. There's an organization called Black Lives Matter. They've got a website, they've got a like manifesto and a mandate, but Black Lives Matter is way, way, way more than that specific organization. Yeah. Black Lives Matter was a rallying cry and it was a cultural movement and is a cultural movement uh, that sort of covers all of North America and has moved global, I think, in a significant way. Um, and so uh, at a broad conceptual level, the phrase Black Lives Matter is, first of all, is no threat to Christianity at all. Yeah. It's actually perfectly, it's a perfectly Christian idea in my opinion. Um, and some people will respond by saying, yeah, but don't all lives matter? And of course they do, but... Um, that's a little bit like saying, and this, I'm going to fall back on a pretty common metaphor here, but one that I really like, it's a little bit like saying, uh, your neighbor's house is on fire and he says, Hey, I need a hose. My house is on fire. And, and I really don't want my house to burn down. My house matters. And you say, well, my house matters too. Well, yeah, but your house isn't on fire, man. That, that person is. And so I, I, I think that, uh, it's pretty easy to demonstrate that, um, the lives of racialized people are under threat in very systemic ways in North America. And to say, my, if, if somebody stands up and say, my life matters, our response should be, wait, why do you, 
what what happened that you don't think it does? And, and how can we learn and how can we fix that? And to respond, all lives matter sort of misses the point because all lives, ha we've said that for centuries and they actually haven't. They haven't, yeah. So that's why this needs to be said. Yeah, right. we're pointing out the, the, the group of people whose lives have not historically mattered is saying, the same you have not valued our lives. Mm -hmm. and, and the answer, well, you should value our lives too. It's just not a very helpful way to move And then forward. in particular contexts to say it, refers to something either local or regional or national that's going on and yep. so you're not necessarily supporting an organization that you have to sign on the dotted line you are especially as a christian you're saying yeah i mean let's let's support mm -hmm. what this is after and yeah. and also uh, be interested in it curious yeah be, yeah, be curious yeah. listen try to learn yeah. and part of the question too was do i have to sign on to everything that x y or z organization is about and the answer here is of course you don't um, and But one of the things we recognize as Christians is that the church is always engaged in a very complicated um, conversation with all of the other kind of cultural players anywhere that it happens to be. Um, and the church is never signing on completely to anything, but that's not the same as not participating at all, right? Like if I vote in an election for a particular political party, that doesn't mean I sign on to everything that they think. Uh, I'm trying in the best way I know how to participate with that conversation. Similarly, even if we do talk about the specific organization, Black Lives Matter, okay, let's talk about that organization. Maybe you have a hang up with one or two or five or 10 of their specific ideologies. That's understandable. And, and that's something that you can think and you can express those opinions. Doesn't mean you can't work with those folks to get good things done in your community. Also, I like what Tim Keller said the other day is like, if you are going to disagree with something, read, yeah. the, read or listen to the explanation of that thing you suspect you disagree with on their terms rather than taking the soundbite, um, distorted, nasty sort of sum ups mm -hmm. given by people that already oppose it. Like, yeah. because when you, you're just playing right into the, European colonizing impulse if all you do is assume that your understanding of that to you strange way of putting it is the only understanding there's like, there's your colonizing impulse right there to not learn from the source this and then you could be, disagree yeah you but, can but you got to learn about it first from right? the source yeah yes. from the source and this is like this is one of those things I hammer at my students about all the time and I think you probably do too is and I the no, way I'm I really was, nice no, the, I mean the, yeah, yeah. I, I put this under the heading for my students of charity. And I say that if you're reading anything, it is your fundamental Christian responsibility to, to read it or experience it or encounter it with a, um, a disposition of charity, which means you want to listen to the very best version of yeah. it. And you want to listen to the very best version of it with your very best heart and mind. So you want to understand it as fully as possible. And if you come away from that disagreeing, and, and sometimes you may come away disagreeing vehemently and that's okay but be charitable in your engagement let's understand it first yeah. understand first yeah yeah i see that too Although, yeah i think we got around we probably got around this question yeah <laughs> maybe that, i don't know i don't know if there's more people can can go more but lee go ahead you got anything else for us so i think i want to move the questions kind of more directly tied to the church piece now and like uh there's a number of there's kind of three points and about kind of reading um reading scripture and then how do we address this in the church as pastors and then kind of critical race theory and, and christians um so the first question uh, uh can you say a word about how culture sometimes helps us read the bible better is there a current cultural moment helping us as christians with privilege take a step back and rethink how to read scripture better yeah i mean we should probably start going a little more rapid fire here but um <laughs> I mean, I have, been, and we were in college at the same time. It was twenty five years ago now. Jeez, we were yeah. probably first both read liberation theology and black theology, and then later reading disability theology. Yeah. So much is there yep. in these theological movements, and they're not even new anymore. There's always new stuff coming out, and it is profoundly Christian and theological, yep. and it's just blowing my mind repeatedly about you know how to go back to these same texts and see. They have, there's such hope in them, yeah. right? So I don't know. I mean, so I think we already gave two really good examples of this this evening. You talked about Willie Jennings' rereading of Acts 2, which I agree with you, is super uh, generative and interesting and really inspiring and would not exist apart from his social and cultural location and his blackness and his understanding of black theology. That generates a lot of 
really beautiful things that are deeply and profoundly Christian. Um, I talked earlier about um, about the, the sort of economic philosophy of the of the Plains Cree, which I think is still present uh, in in lots of the the economic and and um, environmental thinking of uh, various indigenous people in North America. I think that's a place we can learn an awful lot as Christians. I think that one of the things facing us in the future is how we as Christians engage with God's creation. There's an awful lot we can learn. Uh, from the people around us on that front, and they can help to reframe this conversation a little bit for us. Yeah, I mean, if there are teachers or pastors or interested lay people or church leaders tuning in today, you know, uh, there's so many good resources, yeah. such great books. We're going to actually put a bibliography up at some Lots point here read. and make available just the tip of the iceberg. Ask your pastors and, and, and demand of yourself that you read something from the last 20 years that's, that's doing theology with this stuff in mind, it is yep. such interesting and fascinating and, and yep. I don't want to say groundbreaking. It's, uh, my faith has been revitalized again and again in the mode yep. of repentance. It's not, it's not easy reading sometimes, but so, there's such good stuff out there and it makes your preaching come alive and you can preach to the moment mm -hmm. without getting caught up necessarily in the, the sloganeering. You can preach with precision yep. and find the ways that Jesus is with these movements. So I don't know, we, I want to go a little bit more rapid fire, but you said there yep. was a sort of few phases to this question, Lee? Yeah, and then the, the next one, I will, yeah, we will, if we can, we don't want to cut it too short. We're not going to get to all the questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> Our but fault. just Plus to kind of wrap it up, uh, the last two questions, I, I, I think from my understanding of them, they feed off of each other um, and are somewhat related in how we, we address it in the church. Is, uh, so in churches, there can be an anti-woke uh, sentiment uh, that crops up whenever teaching on the Bible and race. How can churches reteach on this topic uh, in the Bible? Uh, and then why is there such kind of animosity towards critical race theory that you, and how should we engage this and kind of oppose it? And Yeah, I think I get where this question is going. Um, I'll start with critical race theory. The first thing I'll say here is I think that by and large critical race theory is, re is very poorly understood by a lot of its opponents. Not all of them, but a, but a very large number of them uh, seem to be unwilling. Uh, a, a few minutes ago, we mentioned um, the sort of the basic principle of doing your homework well, right? Of like reading charitably and reading well and taking seriously the sources that actually the, the thinking comes from. I don't think think that a lot of the detractors, uh, a lot of the Christian detractors of critical race theory have done their homework very carefully. Uh, I've been following some of the Southern Baptist Convention um, denouncements of critical race theory, and I've read some of what they've said. And, uh, and I'm not a critical race theorist by, by discipline. It's kind of a legal sociological yeah, discipline. Yeah. It's sort of a specific, like we, we actually, we have a, we have a, a specialist in critical race theory here on uh, at Ambrose on, on faculty named uh, Dr. Manetta Bailey. And, and, and Dr. Bailey has been really instrumental in helping me understand some of this stuff and doing my own homework on it. Um, but just reading some of those denouncements, uh, even with my sort of, you know, relatively amateur level understanding, it's pretty clear to me that, that folks have not done their reading right. and don't really understand. Or have so, read with very thick glasses. Yeah. With yeah. very kind of biased lenses. So I, we can't go into a whole rundown of critical race theory, but this is what I'll say. Um, critical race theory isn't the boogeyman. Um, it has lots of explanatory value. It's useful in a variety of settings. It's also not like the end all be all of any conversation about race. And so I think we actually, uh, on the bibliography, I think we have a link to, uh, did we put a link to that blog? I haven't got the link yet, but. Uh, we'll, we'll find it. We'll find a way to get people a link to this, uh, um, to a, a couple of resources on critical race theory, because there are, there's really good stuff out there. Uh, that you can read uh, that isn't that onerous if, if you're willing to put in like a 20 minute read that will give you a pretty good basic introduction to the the, the stuff about critical race theory. The key is if there are disagreements to be had, they're gonna be over precise things yeah. within it. The broad sweep of what it's after, it seems amenable to me, to what things we need to learn. Yeah. I think so too, which is, all, which, is, which is frequently the case with Christianity and its cultural location, right? Christianity always exists in a culture, right? Christianity always exists in a time and a place um, and has to be in conversation with that time and place. Yeah. If there end up being movements and groundswells in our time that we have to learn to oppose so as not to make the mistakes of the past, you won't get there without doing your homework yeah. yet. And collectively too, we're us learning yeah. from each other. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, in terms of anti-wokeness, 
I mean, I'm super tired right now, so I'm sort of anti-woke. Like, I'd <laughs> rather be sleeping. Uh, but, like, why wouldn't you want to be woke? Like, it used to be, like, a good phrase. And it In got the turned... Bible, it's, like, the, the you... metaphor for being, uh, for being attentive to God. That like, your eyes are open and you're the awake. The apocalyptic moment is yeah. the unveiling of reality. Now, are all movements that call themselves woke? Again, we're in the same category. Well, it depends what yeah. you might disagree with certain things. but you got to get into the weeds on some of this. If we're going to oppose something, let's be precise about it and understand it first. Yeah. And that goes for this too. Um, Anti-wokeness sort of sounds like a predisposition to oppose something that, you know, on the back of our last 90 minutes together here, it's something we're, at least for our part, we'd say we shouldn't be predisposed to oppose <laughs> yeah. this cultural moment. Yeah. Um, especially because the gospel and even the church, even by, in its repenting, which seems like a negative thing, can be a witness for Christ on yeah. it at this point. And if to refuse to repent or even take part in this conversation is sort of a witness against Christ. It's almost anti-Christ, I would say. Yeah, one of the things I get real upset about sometimes in this conversation is that um, folks who uh, folks who, who want to sloganize against wokeness or against critical race theory, I almost get um, a vague sense of like, envy that they didn't get to this first and so now they're going to be against it i just like no it's okay that somebody who's not a christian is dragging us into this conversation uh, well, they shouldn't have to but they are and so we should probably get on board it's also important to remember especially those of us that are on social media that some voices have megaphones Oof. that are bigger than the churches they seem to represent and i you're talking about earlier about how I'm, I'm a bit of an optimist. I still think that most Christians aren't the person behind that megaphone. Most of us and those tuning in today, we're all just like, yeah, we want to learn about this. Yeah. And that's the thing. So let's start, maybe let's take some megaphones away from some harmful voices if we can. I mean, or mute them at least. Mute them. Yeah, don't listen. Yeah, and yeah. Let's pivot to those people that are just trying to follow Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit into this yeah. reimagined. The world is in, in, in a real crisis. And we yeah. need to be, have our ears open. Yeah. Well, John uh, and Colin, I would love, like to thank you so much for uh, your time tonight. I want to thank you for being willing to have this conversation with us. I know that looking at the questions and the chat that's been going on, it appears that our participants and audience have really enjoyed themselves. Um, I want to let everybody know that we do have one more public lecture coming up next month on um, March the 11th, and that public lecture is entitled Development Aspects of Poverty and Why It Should Matter to You. And I would encourage um, all of you to come and join us again next month. Tomorrow, hopefully by around noon, you will be receiving an email. In that email will be included a, a short survey, and anyone who fills that out will be entered in to win a free book. Um, which we would love to send off to you as well. Uh, it will also include a recording of tonight's public lecture that we invite you to share with uh, your friends and re-watch it. And it's there for you to use. It's a kind of a gift from uh, Ambrose to you as a resource for you to have. Um, we are also gonna do our best to include some of the slides uh, that the gentlemen uh, used tonight. Uh, we'll figure out how to get that to you, whether they'll be posted on the alumni page as a a link to a resource. I'm really not sure, but um, we'll figure that out and get it to you. And again, thank you so much, everybody. It's been our pleasure um, to host you this evening. And again, um, John and Colin, thank you for your time and for being a part of this. Um, I'm really excited to see where these public lectures lead us. It's like I say, it's the one good thing about COVID. It's brought us together is from C to C, we can join together via Zoom. So Good night, have a, a healthy, a safe uh, weekend, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you again, Colin. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, can you hear me?